How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah? Okay, I saw like a quick, yeah, and everyone's, uh, it's like, uh, did he say something? Okay, good. I see those two thumbs up on the front row. I'm starting to get a little tired. I stayed up too late last night. Again, tonight for a little bit, so I'm looking forward to that as well. So this is not the end, even though today we are talking about the end. We've been talking about how God works and how He's at work in all circumstances, working out His plan, and ultimately that plan is to save a people through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Promised One, who would give His own life to win the victory on behalf of His people. And that story doesn't end at the cross. It ends at the end. So if you have your Bible, please turn to the very end of your Bible. We're going to look at some verses from Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. Now, Revelation can be a scary book, can be a confusing book. I think, what is going on in here? When is all this going to happen? But I'll give you kind of a spoiler alert. Revelation is really not meant for us to figure out the exact sequence of events at the end. It's to give us an unshakable confidence in the Christ who wins at the end. That's what Revelation is about. And we see that especially in those last couple chapters. But that's what's happening all the way along. We're reminded of it in the song we sang Sunday night, This Is My Father's World. Right? This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong, and that's some of what we've been talking about all week, seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied. And earth and heaven be one. And that is exactly what we see at the end of the Bible. So that indeed we can sing what we just affirmed together. As we were singing to ourselves, Be still my soul. Thy God doth undertake to guide the future as He has the past. Because sometimes we can look at these stories and go like, well, that was the Bible. That was important. That was so that Jesus would get here. That's, I, and I like that. But does he care that way about me? Does he have a plan like that for me? And the answer is, yes, he does. Do you ever wonder about your future? When you think about your future, now you guys are young and talented and dedicated and all that, so you probably think of promise and opportunity, and that's great. You get a little older and there's a lot of fear and uncertainty, and maybe for you that's already there. Right? Am I going to make it to where I want to go with my music? Will this ever turn into a career? Some of you are like, I already gave up on that a long time ago. Okay, maybe you didn't. That's fine. But will, how will my life go? And some of you have already had really difficult days. You go, well, I know life is not just smooth sailing where everything goes the way that you want it to. There can be fear, uncertainty, even amidst all the promise and the opportunity of the future that is in front of you. And as you face those fears, as I try to help myself, (laughs) my family, people in our church, face those fears, I've found it helpful to go here, to the end of the story. Because often what's happening is we're concerned about what's going to happen in two years. Six months, two years, maybe even we're long-term planners, five years, ten years, fifteen years down the road. It's helpful to start a million years down the road and work back from there. Because if you're in Christ, what will be your story in a million years? You'll be with Him. You'll be with all His people. There will be no more sickness, sadness, crying, sin, pain, loss. There will be nothing to lose. We will have gained everything in a way that can never be lost. And because that's true, we can walk forward with confidence now. So let's look now at Revelation 21, verse 1. 
John's writing says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And then skip to Revelation 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That is the Word of the Lord. That is your story. If you are in Christ, and you may have noticed at the end of the reading from Revelation 21 that there's a long list of people who won't be there. And if we are honest, we're all on that list. Right? Did you see the last one? And all liars. Like, I thought I was doing pretty well. Then all of a sudden, no one's going to make it. But there's a whole lot of people that make it. So how do they make it? They make it through faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who never committed any of the sins on that list and gives his righteousness to everyone who trusts in him. And so if you are trusting in him today, not your own goodness, not your own ability, not your own works, but in Christ and his perfect life, he lived the life that you were supposed to live and haven't. He died the death that each one of us deserves on the cross. He bore our sins, 1 Peter says, in His body on the tree. He took our sins. He took our punishment. He took the wrath of God for us. But He didn't just die for our sins. On the third day, He rose triumphant over sin and death Satan and the grave. And He lives forever now to save all the way everyone who comes to God through Him. That is really good news. Because everyone here has done at least one thing and probably multiple things on that list in verse 8 of Revelation 21. But by God's grace, our story 
is that we are His people. That heaven is coming down to us. Sometimes we think like, okay, I'm going to die and go to heaven, and then that's, that's it. I'm going to be up there, and it's going to be really neat. And I don't know exactly what, because it's kind of like, how do you even imagine that? But the biblical picture is the one we just read. That heaven actually comes down to earth. That God fulfills through the work of Christ, the plan that He always had in place, which was to dwell with His people in paradise on this earth. We read in Revelation 21, the voice saying, or the one seated on the throne saying, it is done. Now on the cross, we know that Jesus said, it is finished. It's hard for me to comprehend the difference between it is finished and it is done, right? If you, when, we, when rehearsal is over and you're dismissed, right? Either one works. Whew, it's finished. It's done. It's, it's over. But on the cross, Jesus could say it is finished because He was done bearing the brunt of the price of our sin. Paying the penalty for us. But on that last day, the Alpha and Omega, who is Jesus Christ, will say, it is done. And everything is, it's, it's, it's done. It's over. It's the beginning of that new era. That new age with God and all His people. And you and I are living in the moments in between, the moments in between it is finished and it is done. And so our faith looks back to the cross because He really finished the work. And there's a way in which we can say He decisively won the battle. The ending is guaranteed. It's over. But there's still time. There's still stuff. There's still us between it is finished and it is done. And so in these last few minutes together, I want to kind of pull on some threads. Now, this is going to be tough, but in your rehearsals, they expect you to remember what you did yesterday and the day before and before that, right? Can we do that in chapel too? Okay. Great. So Leah was on Monday, right? And you remember that she thought she could finally get love, that she could finally get status through the children that she bore to her husband. Finally, he will love me. But on the fourth one, she didn't say, now my husband will love me. Now my husband will be attached to me. She said, this time I will praise the Lord. And that was Judah, the one through whom David and ultimately Jesus would come. She learned her lesson. It was finished. She got it. But it wasn't done, right? Chapter 30, the sibling rivalry ramped up even more. That's when they started giving their servants to their husbands so that they could get more children. She had learned the lesson, like so many of us have learned so many lessons, and then we need to learn it again. David won the victory over Goliath, right? The stone sinks into his forehead. He falls down. David cuts off his head with his own sword, and it's over, right? Well, it's finished. The enemy's defeated, but the battle wasn't done, remember? The whole army, that's us. We share in the victory of our champion. And the battle wasn't actually done. They ran into the battle. And in the strength of his victory, they won. They didn't just watch once the decisive blow had been struck. Yesterday, Esther won the favor of the king and saw Haman, the evil enemy who would destroy them, instead be the one who is destroyed, right? But on that fatal day, the 13th day of the 12th month, they couldn't just say, well, Haman's dead, so don't come at us. They fought back. They participated 
in the victory that Esther had already won. And they defended themselves against their remaining enemies. Because we still have an enemy today. There is a way in which Satan was defeated decisively on the cross. And yet, he is still active and seeking to devour anyone that he can. But he is a defeated foe. And we can withstand him. Not because we're stronger than he is, but because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And in all of them, God was working out every detail of their lives. Right? And we saw it in so many ways. We're not going to go back through all those because I'm just going to count on you guys to remember those. In all these details, God put them in exactly the right place at exactly the right time to accomplish exactly His will for them. Now, there were many times they couldn't see it. Where you go, this is bad. This is wrong. And you're, and you're even right about that. And God hates injustice. One of the major themes of Revelation is His judgment on His enemies. That He's coming back to make the wrong things right. To judge His enemies and to save His people. And that's why we can leave vengeance to God. He will take care of it in the end. If not for us to see in this life, He will take care of it in the next And so I want to tell you a couple stories from my own life. And it's not because my own life is that special. Because I'm sure I could grab any of the faculty from here and they could come down and tell you better stories than the ones I'm going to tell you now. But I want to tell you two stories from my own life that are reminders that God works through your own mistakes. right? Because there are times we can think, I have blown it. I did that sin, or I wasn't prepared for that moment. I messed it up, and now my life is off track. I've I've missed God's will, and it's... I don't know. That's not how it works. God can superintend even in those things. Now again, it's not that we just float through life. God's going to take care of it all. I don't do anything. No, the Bible never gives us that kind of permission. It pushes us toward obedience to Christ, toward following Him, and then when we stumble and fall back toward Him in repentance and faith. When I was 14, I just finished my freshman year. I was in my freshman year in high school. My dad got fired from his job. And it was the kind of job where they told him it'll be six to nine months before you find anything else. And you go, he asked in his sudden exit interview at 5.20 on a Monday night, why? What's what's your cause? What's your reasoning? I "I can't really tell you anything. I just know you'll be better off. It's like, what does that mean? You can't tell me that. Right? It was wrong. And he hadn't done anything wrong to lose that job. And so he took a day to grieve and then started working on a resume. Those were on paper back then. So we're going to do a little, like we did that, I think yesterday, talking like way back in the old days. Um, there was no monster.com, which is already passe. There was no Indeed. There was no LinkedIn. And you guys are like, we're not looking for jobs yet. What are you talking about right now? Um, But you know that everything happens online, right? That's where you learn about stuff. That's where you learn about people. That's where you learn about jobs when you get older. They're posted. And they're posted for a while. And they just sit there. And you have time to see them. But you know how they did it back in the old days? Companies listed jobs in newspapers. You're like, what's a news? I know. Okay. (laughs) Okay. You've seen them in, like, movies, right? Oh, you guys are musical kids. You've seen Newsies, right? Okay, great, good. We have a connection. Okay. That was how people used to get their news, all right? And that's also how people used to find out about jobs. And so there was this 
company in Columbia, South Carolina. They were looking for a new person for a particular role. That was the kind of job my dad would apply for. And they advertised it one time in one paper the Sunday after he got fired. If his boss had waited around and not brought in the new guy until one week later, my dad would not be in the role that he's been in for the last 29 and a half years. That has been, I can't even describe how vital for our family. Now, I hated it because I was 14 and we moved to a new city. And I left my school where I'd been my entire life my church I'd been my entire life, my friends, and my dad wondered, am I even making the right decision? But it was so clear. God has worked this out. And He has planned this moment from eternity. Not so that my dad could be in the line of Messiah like we're going all the stories. And you don't always get to see that clearly. Right, so I don't want to paint this false picture. Everything bad, you'll just see a week later why it was so clearly God's will. That's often not how it works, right? We sang that in Be Still My Soul. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Like that's when we see Jesus. <laughs> it will be bright. We don't know. We don't always have that story. But that's one of those moments that we can point back to. We can go, okay, we see it in the Bible. This is who God is and what He's doing. And we still now, almost 30 years later, point back and go like, God's at work. Whatever is going on, as hard as it is, as out of the blue as it is, as wrong as it is, God is at work. And He has a plan. We don't know what that plan is. We don't know it's always going to just work out better and be so obvious and we'll know. We can't always tell, just like in the stories this week, they couldn't always tell God was at work. But He always was. And now, uh, a story about me. So, I did not major in music, but I went to a school, uh, I went to Bob Jones University down in Greenville, South Carolina, and I had a lot of opportunities uh, that really I shouldn't have had um, with music, and one of them came because I'm an idiot. Okay, so back then they had, I think, five different choirs. Most of them had 40 people in them. Uh, one of them had between 50 and 60 people in it. And there were a lot of students and a lot of students who wanted to do music, and I thought I was a pretty good singer. I thought I even had reason to believe that I was a pretty good singer. And I auditioned that fall, my freshman year, to try to get into choir. It, it was like, it's, I don't know, you guys are music kids, so you might get, it was a big deal to get into one of these choirs. And then there was even kind of like within the choirs, it's a big deal to get into a particular choir. And I thought I was something, and I didn't prepare. And you're like, see, this is the idiot part. You know, you prepare for auditions, right? And I'm like, well, I can just sing anything. You know, give me a hymnal, I'll, I'll sing something, and it'll be fine. Then on top of that, I had a cold, Right? And so I go in, I've got this cold, but also I'm completely unprepared. And so I sing something, I don't remember what, something out of a hymnal, and some pianist is like, what is this guy doing? Uh, and there's all of these really scary looking, you know, all the choir directors are out there and their assistants are out there and I'm staring at all these people going, I am not ready for this moment, but I'm probably good enough to get in anyway. Uh, which was not the right thing. And I even, in my kind of hubris, chased down someone, I chased down the wrong person, actually. <laughs> it's great. Uh, somebody that I thought was the director of the choir that I wanted to get into. And I chased him down. I was like, I have a cold. I'm not, please, you know, still let me in. And he's like, I'm not the guy you're looking for. And it's like, oh, man. Okay. So when they did callbacks, guess who didn't get a callback? This guy. But... Every year, uh, our school did an opera in the spring. That year, they were doing Fidelio, Beethoven's only opera. I think it's like originally a French story sung in German, set in Spain, written in England. It's very confusing. And 
they needed a prisoner's chorus for that opera, that they were going to pull some people from choirs, but then they're like, hey, we have all these people who tried out, who auditioned for choir but didn't get in. We'll give them kind of this mercy thing. I'm sure they're willing to come to rehearsals a couple nights a week for, you know, five months to, to have their 15 minutes on the platform, on the, on the stage, uh, as the prisoner's chorus uh, in Fidelio. And so there were like just, just a number of people auditioning. There were like 30 guys that they called for that. Like it wasn't just me. There were a lot of guys that had tried and didn't get in. They call us all and they're like, all right, we are going to make a prisoner's chorus out of you guys. And so I got to sing in that. And then I auditioned again in December, trying to get into choir. Now, at, going into second semester, it's not the same thing. You're auditioning with one guy in a studio, and he, he kind of knows how many spots are open in each choir. And he's like, oh, we'll do this guy in that one and this guy in that one. So I auditioned with this guy who's not even one of the directors. He's a graduate assistant. And uh, also practical life lesson. When I was young, I thought I was a bass because men sing bass. Uh, so all the way into college, I thought that I was a bass. And it was in that audition, he's like, I'm going to put you for tenor two, and you're probably really a tenor one, and I, we'll, we'll get there. So be open to how the Lord might work in your life through other people. That's, that's just bonus, OK? So I audition with this guy, and he's like, OK. And I, and I get a call back, and I get into one of the choirs where I'm now singing tenor. Now remember, in the fall, I thought I was a bass. So when I got the call back for the opera, I'm a bass. So I'm singing tenor in my voice lessons that I got into in the spring, and then tenor at 4 o'clock in the afternoon in my choir, and then from 7 to 10 I'm supposed to sing bass. I really wish that had been switched. And so did my choir director when he found out. I didn't think it was a big deal to tell him. Again, this is the whole like Rob's an idiot story. You're like, where, where is this even going? Then there was a moment where they were auditioning within that prisoner's chorus, which now included the top choir in the university, the chorale, they picked four guys out to audition for two solos in the opera. Now, the real stuff went to stars on the Metropolitan Opera. They brought in guest artists for that. Okay? And then GAs would get the kind of middle roles. GAs would sometimes just be the understudies for the top roles. And then choruses were basically what students did, especially freshmen, non-music majors did. And they pulled out four people for an audition. They sent everyone else to the green room. And you've got four people with the maestro and the choral director. And they're going to audition them. I'm in the green room. I didn't get picked even to be auditioned for this. And then I'm sitting in the green room. And all of a sudden, this GA who did my secondary audition that I hoped I would never be in because I'd be in a choir first semester, comes in and says, Rob, you need to come out here. Like, they did not call my name. I know what my name is, right? They didn't say it. He says, no, 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 I talked to them. You are auditioning. He went to them and said, I've got a guy for this role. I heard him sing a couple months ago. You need to hear him sing for this role. So I step out. The other four guys have already done their audition. They were already the ones who were supposed to be up for these two solos. I sing, and five minutes later, they call everyone, else, call everyone out and announce Robert Chisholm as one of the two solos in the opera. My mom was so proud. Because <laughs> my name was in the program, just like the guest artist. It doesn't say where they're from. It just says boom, 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 right, in order of appearance. And like, there it is. There's my name. I'm sure she still has that program somewhere. Now that solo was about 15 seconds long. I got yelled at by the maestro repeatedly for my poor German. <laughs> but I can stand and say to a bunch of musicians, I sang a solo in a real opera. And I, <laughs> at the dress rehearsal, the soprano and Fidelio, those of you who know it, that's the one that turns um, sopranos into mezzos. But she was real, she was really good. She was like 6'6". Six, six. The tenor was 6'9", so them falling in love was, you know, it worked on the stage. <laughs> and she taps me on the shoulder and I turn around and I'm like, yes, ma'am, at the like cast party after the dress rehearsal. 
And she's like, oh, you did a very good job. I was like, ah, I just want to like melt into the floor, right? This is an amazing moment that I wouldn't have had if I had been prepared. And again, the moral of the story is not be super unprepared for your next audition because you never know where it's going to lead. <laughs> that is not the moral of the story. But it is that God knows what He's doing. And He is writing your story. And He can write a better story than you can imagine. Because it is finished. And one day He will say, it is done. So we are free then. In a world of uncertainty, in a world of auditions, and am I going to make it? To walk with Him by faith, doing the work in front of us that He's given us to do, from a place of deep rest and confidence, not in ourselves, but in Christ, and what He's accomplished, what He has promised. It doesn't mean you'll always get the solo or get the job, but it does mean that Jesus has already taken care of your greatest need, that He has already told you who you are in Him, that He has already promised to be with you to the end, and that the end is the beginning of a life that is greater than you can imagine. In and with Christ, that is your story. Take hold of it by faith. Let's pray. Oh God, thank You. Thank you that you were at work. Would you bless each one here today? Would we be confident, not in ourselves, but in Christ? And would we be ready to share stories of your grace, your mercy, your kindness, your love, even as we work today to prepare what you've given us to prepare for the concert tomorrow night? Would you help us would you help us to work from that place of deep rest and confidence in what you have done, what you're doing now, and the very good ending that you're bringing. In Jesus' name, amen.